gentlemen, let's start the fourth session uh, of our conference. Uh, since we have already a 10 minutes uh, long delay, uh, let me welcome our uh, speakers today. First of all, Martin uh, Kratoshvil, um, who studied sociology and demography at Charles University Prague. He works at, at uh, STEM, Empirical Research for Democracy. And in his research, he focuses on political opinion, electoral models, and the methodology of quantitative research and data analysis. So it's not a surprise that he will speak about the Czech opinion on foreign countries over the last three decades and the Czech's percep perception of Russian war against uh, Ukraine. So the floor is yours. Today's presentation as already my four speaker. And thank you. So sorry. So as my four speaker already mentioned, I'm going to bring you some uh, sort of harder evidence of uh, development of Czech uh, opinions on uh, selected countries. And uh, in the second part of my presentation, I will focus uh, mainly on the development of the uh, opinions on research events, uh, especially uh, and unsurprisingly war and uh, incoming uh, refugees from Ukraine. Uh, what is the opinion of Checks on these uh, topics. Uh, starting with this graph, uh, what you see is uh, the latest uh, installment of our uh, social, soci sociological survey where we uh, ask uh, uh, Czech uh, public to um, evaluate their opinion on each country. We select quite a few and they have to uh, mark uh, give a mark, give one, two, and five, uh, up to five, where five is the worst and uh, one is the best. What you can see there is an average, and as you can see in uh, October, our latest uh, uh, survey, we see uh, Russia being the uh, uncontested, uncontested uh, worst uh, country in this uh, peloton. And uh, it's uh, really unsurprisingly, again, uh, caused uh, mainly by the events uh, in Ukraine and uh, the perception of uh, Russian actions against Ukraine and against Europe itself. What's important to notice is the second uh, gray, uh, second gray uh, mark, and it's uh, for Ukraine, where you can see Ukraine is not gaining uh, through war any uh, uh, too much uh, attention and too much love from uh, Czech uh, society. It's just like they are somewhere there, even if we read so much uh, news, so much events, so much uh, happening there, uh, the, the perception of Czech society as a whole uh, is not changing to much better uh, places. Uh, just to uh, mention, there is only one true friend in Slovaks there, <laughs> in the, in the uh, first place. And Swiss, Swiss, they are not friends like what we see from other uh, from other uh, surveys. They are more like an etalon, something to look upon, uh, something to solve. So, and here I have uh, selected uh, some major countries, uh, starting from the beginning, from top. There is uh, France, Britain, United States, uh, Germany, and Russia. And uh, what do we see here? It's not uh, the average, but uh, the uh, sum of the best, uh, the number one and number two uh, marks uh, given to these countries over the time. What's unique, what we see in STEM is uh, that this uh, long row starts with uh, the year 1994, uh, and it's uh, it uh, spans nearly each year since, uh, so we can see the development of uh, various, uh, various uh, of um, Czech opinion on various countries. Uh, I would like to uh, stop by uh, some uh, some uh, one major event and uh, to see for yourself uh, how to read this uh, long uh, these long uh, threads. So. 
Here we have uh, somewhere uh, in April uh, 2004, there was a major drop down in uh, perception of uh, all uh, Western powers or the major Western powers in uh, the eyes or in the view of uh, Czech uh, population. Uh, I think uh, it might be a little quiz for you. I think <laughs> I'm contested here already, but uh, the events of uh, that year were really important and it is the war or uh, the renewed uh, uh, effort in the war in Iraq. And then you see that this uh, quite um, far away event uh, really uh, had an impact when it happened on uh, the Czech perception of all the NATO uh, coalition members and or all the uh, main powers there. Uh, but uh, what we can see if we follow the uh, the, the threats uh, further in the time uh, for Britain, for France, and also for Germany, uh, for all of them, uh, we can see that they uh, regain their support uh, from the Czech society. It is not the case of the United States who continued this war and uh, added also the Afghan war. And then uh, we can see uh, that uh, they were not able to recover since. Uh, just another story is Russia, or Russia in Czech eyes. Uh, we can see uh, uh, the, uh, we can see the evaluation of Russia in the uh, green uh, lower line there. And I tried to, yeah, it is a bit to be seen, uh, to uh, frame it with uh, the main, um, some main events and also the uh, terms of uh, Russian presidents there. So uh, we see that uh, Russia, Russia was seen as mainly as a threat from the beginning. In the 90s, uh, especially with its instability and uh, poor development uh, in Czech eyes, it was still a threat. Uh, what we can't uh, forget is that uh, Czech Republic uh, became part of NATO and of European Union first in 1999 and in uh, 2004 and uh, until then until we became a, uh, well in discussion of uh, uh, of uh, um, worldwide alliances uh, we were a bit afraid or quite afraid of a uh, possible uh, possible uh, influence of Russia or their actions um, possible against the uh, Czech Republic. Uh, there might be much more other uh, layers to uh, tell this story, one of them being that just uh, it's just a few years uh, prior to start of this line uh, where uh, the last uh, Soviet uh, soldiers uh, left uh, the Czech soil. So there is a strong uh, still a uh, lasting strong uh, reminiscence of this um, occupation and also of the events of uh, 1968. Uh, but what we can see, uh, what is the effect of uh, Vladimir Putin on this, uh, on this uh, opinion of, uh, on, or on the position of Russia in uh, Czech's view is that he somewhat stabilized of mo mostly for his uh, for his uh, time for his uh, all, all of his uh, presidents or uh, premiers uh, or prime ministers uh, positions he stabilized the view of uh, russians in czech eyes uh, it's nothing comparable to our main allies nothing to uh, and I think to uh, compare to even Germany or uh, United States, but still, uh, if you if we see all the line as a whole, there is quite a happy, <laughs> happy, happy times uh, with his second and third term where he uh, was seen, and also uh, it uh, comes from other uh, researches we do. Uh, he was seen as a Russia. What he did. It, develop, uh, it, uh, it influenced also our view on Russia itself. Uh, it's seen with the Medvedev uh, Intermezzo, where uh, also the uh, views on Russia uh, were uh, a bit lower and dropped in, uh, like uh, Putin not being as uh, seen and also not present in uh, Czech media. What's too sorry, I think, uh, personally think, uh, about Czech's view on Russia is that also, the 
war had to come really close to Czech Republic to really impact our view on Russia. There are those two red dots and they mark uh, Gruzian invasion or war with um, uh, Georgia and also uh, the annexation of uh, Crimea and uh, the events on Donbass. And also there is somewhere there uh, uh, around uh, 2013 there's also actions against in Syria, Russia starting uh, around uh, 2015 meddling there. And so we see uh, the, as, as we see, those two years, those particular two years, are missing. But still, if we see, uh, if we look at the other two years uh, surrounding this, the event might have made some wrinkle, but it faded away very quickly. <laughs> so uh, only it comes when uh, the Russian action some, somewhat uh, interconnects with our internal affairs. Uh, for 2021, uh, uh, the May, where we have the uh, second uh, last uh, point uh, measured, there is. Uh, it is just after uh, the actions uh, of Russian uh, Russians in 2014 uh, with uh, uh, their like destroying. Um, Czech um, um, ammunition depots uh, and uh, where really Czech Russian um, relations started to fall down. Also, the diplomatic relations were frozen. Uh, many diplomats were uh, returned back to Russia, and also Czech diplomats uh, were returned back to uh, Czech Republic. And since then, and it, we can also see it as a summer somewhat of a preparation of the Czech population for the war next year, uh, the, uh, the opinion on Russia started to dwindle. For Ukraine, we have much shorter, uh, shorter row, but still what is here to be seen is that uh, they, same as Russia, the uh, Ukraine uh, is in Czech opinion, seen as some somewhere there, somewhere they they are not affecting us. It's nothing uh, of our concern. Only maybe those who come here and work here and take our jobs and something like that. And most of the years, mo may maybe all the new uh, new uh, millennia, uh, up until the war, uh, the post-Soviet uh, uh, space was seen as a as one one thing. Like, like in the in the in the mind of or the collective mind of Czech uh, society, it was seen something like, there they come here, buy something here. Uh, they are not our friends. They are not our, any foes. Uh, uh, we really are suspicious towards them. What we uh, do not care about them, and it's also seen uh, in uh, the recent three uh, dots for Ukraine. There, if you we will uh, we can see the a bit uh, better uh, perception of Ukraine uh, right after the war, which again started to fade away very quickly, and nowadays it's back to its pre-war state. So, it's for the lines, <laughs> and now to uh, something we can see in a much closer detail, and it is the uh, opinion on uh, Ukrainian refugees coming to uh, Czech Republic and uh, receiving help from uh, Czech state and Czechs. What we can see here, it might seem as some something mediocre. Uh, we see that uh, right after the war, uh, uh, it is um, starting from uh, bottom. Uh, the timeline goes up uh, from uh, early April, where we measured it first, up to that October we measured it last, and we see that outburst of. Uh, Solidarity and maybe uh, support uh, just in early April and just after the war, that again normalized very quickly. And then what is good in it stays the same. Like even after uh, even after the harsh uh, autumn and upcoming uh, like really uh, dim outlook for uh, Czech economy er and uh, well-being still. Uh, the support towards uh, 
Ukrainian refugees is quite substantial. Uh, it's really important to see Czech society as really anti-migrant, anti-refugee oriented. Uh, should it happen maybe five, seven years ago uh, during the uh, refugee crisis, it would be, it might be, much different uh, picture here. Uh, what is really concerning us is the quarter of Czech uh, uh, society that is strongly against help. And it's where the threat of uh, our position may be changing lies. A similar view we see uh, in Czech's uh, position on the conflict itself. So where uh, we uh, have, uh, this is not just a one question, it's a, it's a complex of uh, it's indices and this is the outcome of it. And we see that we here have a majority, again, not a vast majority, but strong majority of uh, people who support the Western view, who are uh, not concerned or, or who do not uh, take the Russian uh, point of view as uh, something uh, to uh, accept the the like the uh, I, I, uh, the, the 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 strong red uh, I do not have it in the in the legend but it they are already on the Russian side but they are really small minority who uh, accept all Russian uh, narratives and who uh, stands for it. So this is really small, but as we see in the media in here in Czech Republic, really uh, vocal uh, group who uh, tries to persuade and where the uh, trick lies and where the danger lies, it's the, the orange group who are not yet decided, who do not really take it from Russians and do not really take it from uh, Westerners or European Union or United States uh, either. So this is where uh, we are going to form our future, I think, or we think in STEM. Uh, whether this group becomes uh, somewhat more rowdy and uh, really uh, takes in uh, the narratives of uh, Russian uh, misinformation, propaganda, or also the domestic uh, calls for peace. And the last uh, persistent dream for us was really interesting. What interests me personally very much is where it roots and it is the, in this picture where we see again it's a quite quite a small detail here and uh, I edit uh, the last one we have from uh, pre-war situation it is the Czech debate or public debate is not go with Russia or go with United States or the West but the debate is to stay in our uh, ivory tower to be the bridge, to be the second Switzerland. It's really strong dream here. Uh, I uh, assume that uh, you might be able to uh, uh, support me with many uh, examples that this is not just the case of few uh, last years, but this is something that persists maybe since uh, our first uh, republic, maybe well over 100 years. Uh, and the debate is to be with the West, to be active in a, in a way, or to be passive, to be the stronghold, to be the, like, the illusion of uh, independence and being independent. So that's all for today from me, and thank you for listening. Thank you very much for this uh, fascinating presentation, which was full of data visualization and uh, timelines. And it was very important, I think, that it showed how uh, Czech public opinion uh, has been changing in a very long uh, term perspective. Uh, and now our ne next speaker will be Professor Juraj Marusak, who is a Slovak political scientist, historian, and also a journalist. He works uh, in the Institute of Political Science uh, at the Slovak Academy of Sciences, and he deals with uh, Central and Eastern European history in the 20th and 21st uh, centuries, including European integration, national elections, national I identities, and many, many other uh, subjects. 
Okay, so uh, uh, dear ladies and uh, gentlemen, the topic of uh, my presentation will be the reflection of uh, Russia in the collective memory of post-communist Slovakia in the context of its aggression uh, against uh, Ukraine. So, um, of course, the uh, outbreak of the so-called Ukraine crisis in 2013, 2014, um, uh, uh, is, um, was reflected also on the uh, re-emergence of uh, political cleavage in Slovakia, which seems to be forgotten since uh, the elections of 1998. It means uh, in the uh, decomposition of the foreign policy uh, consensus, uh, especially regarding to the relations with uh, Russian, uh, with the R Russian Federation. So uh, this is, uh, it, it in fact, um, a part of uh, Slovak uh, uh, political uh, dispute. Uh, and um, unlike the situation in uh, the second half of 1990s, when um, uh, the, this uh, conflict became gradually uh, uh, declined, dropped down, uh, now we can see the escalation of such conflict. Uh, initially, uh, this uh, dispute, uh, how to uh, interpret the events in uh, Ukraine, the annexation of Crimea, um, the uh, war in uh, Donbass was reflected mostly on, in the media by the so-called alternative media and uh, or by um, a kind of uh, uh, fringe uh, political parties like uh, People's Party, Our Slovakia, it means an, so-called anti-system political parties, uh, but however there was a consensus regarding the non-recognition of the annexation of Crimea, regarding the uh, practical help to Ukraine. However, uh, the first divisions already took place uh, when uh, the issue of Ukraine-NATO membership was uh, raised, so uh, the uh, then ruling party, uh, Smer Social Democracy, um, uh, opposed the Ukraine NATO membership, they opposed the policy of sanctions against the uh, Russian Federation, and they also uh, uh, opposed the negative uh, image of Russia, uh, both uh, Prime Minister Robert Fico and uh, other members of his political party, including his uh, later rival, uh, next Prime Minister Peter Pellegrini, uh, uh, several times uh, stressed uh, Russia is not an enemy of uh, Slovakia. So uh, the relations uh, towards Russia became uh, part of uh, um, uh, political competition, uh, electoral competition before the parliamentary elections in uh, 2020, when uh, just uh, um, uh, Smer uh, and Slovak National Party as the members of the ruling coalition, as well as uh, groups uh, represented by former presidential candidates, uh, uh, Stefan Harabin, uh, so-called uh, Fatherland Party, or um, uh, Eduard Chmelar, uh, Socialist SK, Socialist SK Party, rejected the labeling of the Russian Federation as an enemy and um, uh, criticized also the policy of sanctions towards Russia during the electoral uh, campaign. On the other hand, the uh, parties uh, representing uh, that time the opposition, and now since 2020, party est parties establishing the new uh, coalition, they stressed to strengthen uh, the um, uh, not only European cooperation, cooperation on the EU level, but uh, also uh, and esp especially the cooperation on the level of Euro-Atlantic uh, cooperation and strengthening the security ties with uh, United, uh, United States. This conflict continued after uh, the parliamentary elections and began to escalate to, to the uh, end of 2021 in the connection with the preparation of bilateral defense agreement with the United States. States. Uh, the opposition parties described this agreement not only as a, a threat for the sovereignty of uh, Slovakia uh, in uh, terms of security affairs, but also as a step 
towards the war, war against Russia. So the main message of the demonstrations uh, at the uh, end of 2021, but also at the beginning of this year, was never uh, organized by opposition parties, was never against uh, Russia, nigdy proti Rusku. So um, this is uh, the uh, one level of uh, this deba debates uh, about Russian Federation, about, about Russia. But um, this uh, issue is uh, not uh, only present in the disputes over the specific uh, kind of foreign policy issues or um, uh, solutions, but also it's um, uh, the part of the debate on, about the uh, belonging, uh, be belonging of Slovakia either to the west, to the east, and um, uh, also these uh, issues are implicitly included in some so of the so-called uh, mem uh, memory sites, uh, which are uh, crucial in the terms of formation of the identity of the current Slovak. Uh, Republic. Uh, so the source of uh, its legitimacy, it means the elements of tradition to which all uh, political representations of Slovakia um, that have participated in the activities of the government have so far uh, cons uh, consensually su subscribed are, among others, the traditions of the, of the anti-fascist resistance. Uh, so uh, the anniversary of the Slovak national uprising uh, in to, uh, 29th of August August 1944 is a national holiday of the uh, country. Then also the victory over the fascism uh, in uh, 1945, the 8th of May, is also a national holiday. But also uh, the fall of communist regime and uh, especially also uh, the commemoration of the um, so called of the Prague Spring, sometimes called also in Slovakia Bratislava, Prague Bratislava Spring, uh, and especially the day of uh, 21st of August. And uh, also it's, it is commemorated through the person of uh, Alexander, uh, Alexander Dubček. Uh, the uh, key uh, issue of uh, memory conflict in of the memory wars in Slovakia were uh, concerned before on the attitude towards the Slovak state uh, established uh, as a satellite of uh, Nazi Germany and uh, about the evaluation of uh, its uh, president uh, Josef Tiso. This combination of um, the anti-fascist and the democratic leftist traditions, including the changes in 1989, is symbolized by Slovakia by the person of Alexander Dubček, who is one of the of three integrating figures of uh, contemporary Slovak identity. Uh, it, it means together with Milan Rastislav Stefanik as a co-founder of Czechoslovakia, and uh, Ludovic Štur, leader of Slovak National Renaissance movement. So all these moments, however, are very closely connected with uh, Russia and uh, commemorating these events, these persons, uh, all, um, always uh, one must express uh, their, uh, def define its, uh, his or her attitude uh, toward, towards uh, Russia. So uh, also on the, uh, what are also the main memory tensions in uh, Slovakia are determined by these uh, events. On the other hand, uh, also there is one problem, one issue. Slovakia, uh, together uh, with uh, Czech Republic, adopted the uh, so-called totalitarian um, interpretation of the communist period. Uh, in, according to it, the communist regime was uh, not only an anti-democratic, uh, totalitarian, it means put on the level, on the same level with the Nazi regime, but also uh, even criminal regime. On the other hand, uh, this commemoration is in a big, deep conflict with the generally uh, positive uh, um, communicative memory on uh, the regime of normalization of the Ch regime uh, ruling in Czechoslovakia since 1969 till 1980. 
nine uh, and uh, for many uh, people for a huge segment of Slovakia it is uh, still um, the best period of the uh, nation of the national history so uh, this is uh, one of the main conflicts also another issue is the positive uh, reflection of uh, russia as uh, a crucial player uh, patron of uh, slovak national identity uh, uh, during the period of slovak national uh, national renaissance so uh, this uh, 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 however, uh, officially, uh, Slovak, um, uh, of officially, this uh, Slovak uh, official collective memory codified by laws was uh, not uh, antagon antagonistic, such as uh, in, uh, for example, Poland or uh, Baltic states. Slovakia rather adopted a cosmopolitan approach, uh, friendly approach uh, towards. Uh, also towards Russia. Russia, Russian representatives were always invited to the celebration of such national holidays uh, of Slovakia as the day of, uh, as a victory day or as um, um, uh, the day of Slovak national, Slovak national uprising. Also, uh, uh, Slovakia was uh, several times apprised by representatives of Russia, such as Dmitry Medvedev or Vladimir Putin, for its uh, uh, for the cultivating of, of the memory of Soviet soldiers, uh, for how Slovakia, Slovak Republic cares about the Soviet military, um, about the Soviet military monuments. However, uh, um, in the context of uh, the increasing tensions between Russia and Ukraine in the co and um, subsequently the crisis between West and Russia after the annexation of Crimea, also in uh, Slovakia, uh, um, uh, in the public discourse uh, started to grow the antagonistic approach uh, towards Russia. Russia, which uh, was reflected also on the level of political parties, uh, especially uh, uh, after the uh, since uh, in 2019, uh, the uh, opposition parties, centre-right parties, um, uh, raised the proposal to proclaim the uh, day of the victims of 1968 occupation of Czechoslovakia. It means 21st of August and uh, the day of the departure of uh, occupation uh, troops of the Soviet army from Czechoslovakia, uh, 21st of June, uh, to uh, raise uh, these days uh, to the uh, status of uh, uh, remembrance days of uh, the country. Uh, Central uh, Smer is there together with uh, Slovak National Party and uh, other uh, other pro-Russian nationalist parties opposed this proposal. Uh, therefore, uh, these uh, days were recognized as a remembrance days of Slovakia only in uh, 2020, and first time they were celebrated uh, in such a way in 2021. But what is uh, more also interested, interesting that this proposal uh, um, uh, to raise this anti-Soviet, anti-communist uh, narrative to the official level was uh, not only opposed by the current opposition, but the current opposition also uh, uh, developed the counter-memory. They raised a proposal to the parliament to commemorate the day of uh, 30th of September, the day of the so-called Munich betrayal to uh, the Remembrance Day, as the day of the betrayal of the Western allies of, the, of Czechoslovakia. However, this proposal was not accepted by the, uh, 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 by the parliament. This, uh, <clears throat> um, uh, however, this conflict about the approach towards Russia was also present af immediately after the uh, beginning of uh, Russia's aggression towards Ukraine. It was uh, manifest, uh, manifested in the parliament because uh, um, uh, although the, all, all parliamentary parties, including uh, Smer and uh, People's Party, our Slovakia, led by Marian Kotleba, it is 
in fact, the neo-Nazi party uh, vote, uh, condemned the uh, Russian invasion uh, to, uh, to Ukraine. However, uh, when um, uh, some prominent representatives of SMER and People's Party Our Slovakia, um, including the deputy party's chairman, uh, Ljubos Blaha, and Ladislav Kamenitsky, did not take part in the vote in parliament. They simply uh, were not present in, uh, uh, in the voting. Other, pol uh, other politicians uh, verbally condemned the aggression, but at the same time, they spoke about the responsibility of the West for the war, or uh, they uh, criticized the uh, growing Russophobia or chauvinist approach uh, towards Russia. Uh, only one uh, former presidential candidate, Stefan Harabin, uh, supported the Russian attack on Ukraine, saying, I would do exactly what Putin did with uh, regard to the events uh, of, uh, in Ukraine. For the purposes of today's conference, uh, because uh, the, uh, I don't have enough time, uh, I have identified two key, key historical monu uh, moments that have become the subject of the conflict in the uh, new, em newly emerging or re-emerging uh, geopolitical cleavage in the Slovak society. <gasps> <laughs> So uh, this is the interpretation of the end of the Second World War and of Soviet occupation. So interpretation of the Second World War. So uh, here you, have, you can see the Soviet monument of Slavin. This is a uh, uh, place of the meeting, uh, not only the, meet, the meeting of the pro-Russian political groups in the country, and uh, the place of organizing of political protests, especially after the emerging of the war, organized by the opposition parties now by Smer Social Democracy. And uh, what's happened with uh, Slavin? This uh, Slavin was painted uh, immediately after the outbreak of the war by, in, uh, in Ukrainian colors. It means uh, uh, on one hand, it is interpreted as the commemoration also of uh, Ukrainian soldiers who uh, were uh, uh, who, who fight it in uh, Red Army uh, for the liberation of Slovakia, and the Russian aggression is interpreted as the uh, uh, <coughs> uh, <coughs> the, as the dehonestation of uh, their memory. On the other hand, uh, pro-Russian camp represented it as also as a devastation of the memory on uh, this uh, 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 protests, uh, this uh, uh, paintings on Slavin, graffiti on Slavin, as the dehonestation of memory of Russian soldiers of Red Army. Here you can see the main pro-Russian politician in Slovakia, Ljubos Blaha, the deputy chairman of Smer Social Democracy. Uh, and here is uh, Peter Vidovan. He, it is his nickname on Facebook. And his profile is composed by uh, Slavin, a picture of Slavin Monument and picture of uh, the uh, Berlin in 1945. Here you can see on 8th of May, on 9th of May, uh, it is uh, the celebration of the uh, victory over fascism uh, according to uh, Russian Soviet tradition. Uh, there took place a demonstration of uh, the supporters of uh, Ukraine, but you see uh, they were separated from the, uh, the pro-Russian demonstrations. Uh, it, there took place uh, open conflict between these two uh, camps and uh, uh, also uh, supporters of Ukraine in Slovakia described Russian current policy uh, as fascists. It is a response on the Russian accusations of fascism of uh, Ukraine and uh, they invented also this word Russism. Uh, the, uh, especially in the context of uh, Russian war in Ukraine, also several other uh, Red Army monuments were uh, uh, painted on the red or um, uh, damaged uh, by uh, in Kosice, in Vrano nad Toplou, or they were painted in Ukrainian uh, colors. Uh, all, on the other hand, uh, uh, what about 1968? 
1968, uh, uh, this memory is very difficult to um, uh, establish, to make some revisionist interpretation. However, in Slovakia, it's already uh, in, in progress. So, uh, firstly, uh, the oppos current opposition parties, especially some representatives of Smer SD, uh, they um, accepted the Soviet communist interpretation, uh, the, the Czech communist interpretation of August 1968, revisionist interpretation according to it, it uh, which uh, uh, the Ukrainians uh, are responsible for the Soviet occupation of Czechoslovakia because the decision was adopted by Ukrainian communist Leonid Ilyich Brezhnev. Uh, this is uh, citing uh, Wojciech Filip, former chairman of Communist Party of uh, Bohemia and Moravia. But uh, also uh, uh, the uh, uh, <coughs> so Ukrainians are responsible for uh, Soviet occupation. Another issue is how to um, uh, uh, how to lighten the image of Russians. So to compare the current situation of Slovakia, the presence of American troops in Slovakia, to compare it with the Soviet occupation. This is a Facebook post of one leader of uh, one uh, Slovak nationalist politician, Anna Belousova. Uh, 54, five, 54 years after 1968, we have here once again the foreign troops. What's the difference? Another interpretation is that uh, any kind of political, any kind of pressures of oppressions against the so-called alternative pro-Russian media are described as a neo-normalization. And uh, if the rep uh, people uh, from the pro-Ukrainian camp are <laughs> yes, please conclude. Yes, I'm going to conclude. Uh, Last sentence. Ukraine to uh, current war to Soviet invasion uh, in 1968. Um, uh, for example, Eduard Chmelar, one pro-Russian politician and publicist, says that uh, Zelensky cannot be compared with Dubček because Dubček would never allow such uh, national tragedy of uh, Ukraine. It means he uh, um, uh, says, in other words, uh, Ukraine must capitulate. So the war in Ukraine is escalating uh, the conflict in uh, the Slovak society, and this conflict is uh, uh, already um, uh, <clears throat> has an impact on uh, the crucial uh, moments, uh, crucial issues uh, framing the current, uh, the identity of the modern post-communist Slovakia. Thank you for attention. Yeah, thank you very much for giving us uh, insights into what's happening currently in politics and uh, collective memory in uh, Slovakia. But we are running out of time, so let's move to the next presenter, who will be uh, Reika Sharkozy. Uh, she uh, has been working from 1995 at the Institute, 1956 Institute, uh, which do not exist anymore. And currently, uh, she works as the head of the photo department at uh, National State Cheney Library, and she is mainly interested in historical documentary films. Uh, so the floor is yours. Uh, yes. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you uh, for the invitation, and it's very nice to uh, sh share my research with you here. The memory of the Second World War is controversial in Hungary, and I would like to show it uh, through three documentary films as an example. Uh, in my paper, I will talk about the memory of the tragic episode of the Second World War, the destruction of the Hungarian Second Army. The months of occupation in the Donbass and the subsequent destruction in the winter of 1942-43 are the subject of several narratives. I will look at the representations in documentary films, focusing on a 1982 Hungarian series, Sándor Sára's Chronicle. Subsequent films have all sought to add to or nuance the content. Despite their intentions, yes, uh, to this day, they have failed to undermine 
the dramatic power and credibility of this first one, and uh, thus reinforced its claims and contradictions, not making it any easier to reconcile the memory of the Second World War. The, this absence, unfortunately, indicates that Hungarian society cannot rely on a strong historical vision <coughs> to form a solid position on the war in Ukraine and is vulnerable and unfounded to rumors and deluge of fake news. Yes. The guilty army. After 1945, the overall history of Hungarian participation in the Second World War any attempted interpretation that deviated from the official historical approach subordinated to Soviet considerations, either in academic works or in publicist literature, became untellable, unwritable. It was also impossible to discuss the experience of the Second World War with those who had lived through it and suffered its consequences. In the 1970s, the situations began to change. The first piece of writing on the fate of the Hungarian Second Army, which was also an attempt to analyze the Don disaster, was Istvan Nemeskürti's uh, Requiem for an Army in 1972, which was, which was of revolutionary importance because it brought the subject of Hungarian participation in the Second World War into the public consciousness. Its publication had certainly been preceded by political consultation, so its content could not have deviated from the canon considered the only acceptable one in the regime. It was a real political sensation in 1978 that the memoirs of the former Colonel General Gyula Kadar, head of military intelligence in 1943-44 were published. It was the first time that the right-wing military officer who had gained an important role in the Second World War through his assignments had received a great deal of publicity he considered the publication of this work, which was also a new form of historical information compared to previous practice, to be useful in maintaining the rule of the regime at the time. His memoirs had opened up the possibility of a more nuanced historical representation. The political power, by not permitting the story of the Second World War and the participation of the Hungarian army in it to be told without Soviet ideology inevitably shifted the subject towards those who opposed the regime. This has granted the opposition, especially the right wing, the possibility to formulate different narratives. The image of the destruction of the Hungarian Second Army fitted in particularly well with the fields of vision of intellectuals sensitive to the great national tragedies of fate, who felt the nation was under threat and were concerned about its destruction, and who had a long-standing desire to publicly speak their minds about the important national subjects. The breakthrough came in 1982 with Shandor Shara's 25 episodes long documentary film entitled Chronicle. The Chronicle was an unprecedented undertaking in terms of film history, as no interview series of this length had ever been produced before or ever since in Hungary. The long supra story has been told with great power, and it has also created a new kind of documentary narrative in Hungary for relating the past. The 40th anniversary of the film's making and the approaching 80th anniversary of the winter of 1942-43 serve as a good occasion to reconsider the manifold meanings and intended and unintended effects of the documentary epic built up from the interviews. The Chronicle comprises 120 interviews, exclusively with former Hungarian soldiers. On the one hand, these statements corroborate each other, and on the other hand, the interviews are cautious in their statements for fear of possible accountability. Their self-control was not unjustified. The episodes were occasionally recut, and the screening time was constantly changed. Furthermore, after the 15th episode, the series was banned permanently, which also played a role in the removal of the current president of Hungarian television, Richard Nagy. Ten years ago, 
The military historian Laurent Dombrady wrote a detailed review of the film version of the series, in which he questioned primarily the independence of the creators, thinking from political influences and the historical credibility of the facts embedded in the stories, without disputing or even praising the other merits of the series. In his view, the film series represents the Kadarist position. According to Don Brady, the aim of the filmmakers was not to present the events historically, but to condemn them. He criticizes the film for merely mourning the soldiers, but giving them neither amends nor public recognition for their heroic struggle in desperate circumstances. He therefore considers the film series to be lacking any appreciation of the battles fought and the heroism shown, and perceives its lack of appreci appreciation as a lack of objectivity and professionalism. This need to monumentize the heroic conduct of the army is a recurrent motif in the right-wing frames of the remembrance of Tom Band. The frame of remembrance does not only work according to the intentions of the creator. The same frame may be reinterpreted over time, or it may be interpreted from the beginning in a different way than intended. As proof, I would like to present in detail the most famous episode of the, of the series. This so-called love story led to the banning of the series and the dismissal of the television president. Many people today still see it as a tragically beautiful lyrical episode from the everyday life of war, where everyone is a victim, the Hungarian soldiers and the Ukrainian inhabitants alike. The story is simple. A Hungarian soldier and a Ukrainian, Ukrainian school teacher, left alone with her seven children, fall in love, live together, then lose each other. The vivid narrative of Corporal Shandor Geller, the teacher, and the Transylvanian peasant poet helps us to get a realistic picture of the everyday life of Ukrainian peasants and Hungarian soldiers, which, as this example demonstrates, was by no means without conflict. The Soviets objected that a Ukrainian partisan woman should not be involved in a love affair with a fascist enemy. The Soviet bureaucrats accepted Shandor's view that it was a love story. No one doubted it neither the filmmakers nor the Soviets. This is the narrative that has made it into the history books. No one noticed that the women had no choice. In the introduction to the story, not quoted here but included in the film, it is said that many Hungarian soldiers tried to rape this woman until she got involved with the soldier who told the story. The reason for this, in today's terms, was a sense of responsibility for the children and her own survival, which Shara and the crew interpreted as love. The real victims here are only the woman and another woman involved in the story, and the children. The peasant poet soldier who narrates the story effectively is a violent criminal a rapist. Two contradictory readings of the same story. Both are part of historical memory. Many people accuse Shah of being biased of, by silencing the soldiers' war crimes. He does not do this, although these are indeed given less prominence in this film, but sometimes he does not verse. He overlooks the, these war crimes. He does not perceive them. In the example quoted, the folk tale style and the story distracts his attention from its brutal content. But, uh, the primary aim, uh, yes, at, the primary aim of the creators of the Chronicle was to give the fallen the right to a glorious death and the survivors and their relatives the opportunity to mourn their lost ones in the dignity. This was only possible by drawing a morally acceptable picture of the Hungarian Second Army, of those who participated individually and of the army as a whole, so that the virtual tomb or memorial that had been missing until then could be built. The discussion was only possible right by reinforming the positive elements. Furthermore, the elements of personal stories inevitably build up a myth, which is only reinforced by the fact that it contrasts with the canonized, solely valid, unequivocal, and totally condemnatory official position of the army, which was created under external pressure and which described the army as fascist. In the communist explanation of history, political judgment went hand in hand with undifferentiated moral judgment, one of the means of communication of which was silence. 
Shara and his crew wanted to refuse this judgment through the series, but they could only do it carefully. Nor could they ignore the fact that this army was an ally of the German fascist power, and there was no excuse for that. There was only one possible narrative of this role for them too. Hungary was on the wrong side in the war, and Soviet Union represented humanity as compared to Nazi Germany. In this respect, they accepted the Kadarist canon, dictated also by their own anti-fascist convictions and not just their fear of censorship. They strove for objectivity so that several frames of remembrance operate in parallel in the series, the inescapable Kadarist and the permissive victimhood that became the starting point of the later right-wing narrative. Shara's series was considered biased to such a great extent by his contemporaries that in 2003, the cameraman and the director, Peter Erde, made a counterpart to the Chronicle, interviews with the local population along the river done about the memory of the Hungarian army. The title of the work, Don Itukör, Don Mirror, could also be interpreted as the mirror held to the Chronicle, although the author probably used the metaphor in a broader sense. <coughs> He only listened to one party, the victims, but very late, 60 years after the events. Instead of myth-making, he wanted to deconstruct an already established image by drawing on more recent oral history sources. Erdei feels that there is a deliberate silence about the daily wartime activities of the Hungarian Second Army, the atrocities and executions that took place. He wants to break this silence and force a confrontation with the past. The film's most prominent themes are the descriptions of looting, robbery, tie-ups, beating, and unjustified murders. All, all of this delineates a vulnerable army abandoned for long periods of time, living through extreme situations, and a period of forced coexistence in which everyone was dependent on everyone else, on the military commands and operations, Hungarians on the Germans, Ukrainians on the Hungarians. His obvious bias, however, weakens his credibility and does not form a coherent picture of the war. The heroic army. After 1990, anti-communists became the core of conservative right-wing discourse. All communist claims were subject to revision, with the pre perception of war becoming an important topic. According to this view, Hungarian history is a series of tragedies. The Hungarians are mostly victims, who have been thrown into the war, who have been drifted into it, and are not responsible for the crimes of others. This moral exemption can lead to a relativization, or even a revision of the war. The controlled content of the chronicle inadvertently set the stage for this interpretation. In addition to, to the Kadarist narrative, there are already traces of a new one, which later became dominant on the political right, the past is identical with the history of the suffering of Hungarians. This approach is represented by Janos Litovsky's documentary film Over the, uh, at the Distant Over, Over there at the Distant Dawn, made ten years ago. The filmmakers travelled to the locations of Uriv, Szczucie, Storozhenoye, Puchovo, Korotoyak, the Hungarian military cemetery in Hrutkino, and the film's military experts and military historians were interviewed at the original locations. This is a cinematic military memorial which highlights the positive human deeds and the losses suffered, and it is clearly devoid of any motives and could destroy this memorial. This film fills the gap Don Brady mentions, bringing heroism into the historical memory. However, the film omits the abuses, destructions, and war crimes committed by the Hungarian army. Documentaries can be used to create the so-called foundational stories. Something is needed, a value, a historical reference point, the continuity of which can later be used as a basis of conscience of Hungarian society, and from which a new common set of values can be developed. These three examples clearly show that the Dom Band, and with it the Hungarian involvement in the Second World War, exists in several possible frameworks which are difficult to reconcile. The last time the Chronicle succeeded in doing this was in 1982, but as the example cited shows, it made serious compromises. Two, 
placing the story of the Don disaster in a frame of remembrance that is still disputed today. Hungarian society is not aware of its own role in the past, and its memory of the Second World War is uncertain, a situation increasingly compounded by a lack of historical knowledge and distance in time. Unfortunately, Hungarian historical uh, memory represented in documentary films offer no clues to the equally complex contemporary wartime com uh, conflict, the conflict in Ukraine. Okay. Yep. Thank you very much for this important presentation, which highlighted uh, important memory patterns in Hungary. And let's move now to our last speaker, uh, Valeria Korabiova. Uh, she's affiliated now uh, with the Institute of International Studies at uh, Charles University Prague, but basically she's a professor uh, of philosophy at uh, Taras Shevchenko National University of uh, Kiev, and she focuses on European integration, the legacy of 1989, and the history of uh, independent Ukraine. Thank you so much. Um, many thanks to the organizers, to Dr. Tuma and Dr. Devatova for, for the kind invitation, and many thanks to my distinguished colleagues for all these very enlightening uh, discussions and presentations. So we have been touching upon Ukraine, but now I suggest to, to zoom in and to look what's been happening in Ukraine directly. And what I'm trying to say, I'm not coming from the perspective of uh, memory studies, but I'm coming from the sociological perspective. So the idea is not about the memories and different policies like inside the Ukrainian society, but more like how Ukrainians tackle the issues of history and memory altogether as they are entangled in the relations with Russia. And what I'm trying to do in my presentation is to counter the very well present in media narrative of the sort of rising nationalism in Ukraine ever in the post-Soviet times, which the increasing level of Russophobia, which allegedly triggers some reaction on the Russian side. And what I'm trying to argue instead is basically that Ukrainians have found themselves repeatedly in the position when some historical argument uh, have been weaponized against them and and they were trying to find solutions and they have been trying to find different ones so i will suggest a sort of broad and therefore sketchy overview given being very short of time as i'm the only person standing between you and lunch sorry about that um, so I will try to suggest you an overview how Ukrainians have been trying to, to face the Russian threat looming on the horizon for quite a while, but most explicitly since the annexation of Crimea, and what kind of different approaches to the past and to the history as a political weapon have been uh, devised there. So, like to give you a context, I'm pretty sure that you are well aware of this infamous article already mentioned today that by the presenter on the previous panel on the historical unity of Russians and Ukrainians. Uh, it was largely ignored in the political and international relations community as irre irrelevant, as sort of um, quite a quirky, like exotic hobby of a Russian president, but like not taken seriously as a warning sign towards a big war, right? But if we look at that, and I'm referring to that because the main tropes already articulated by Putin last year have been repeated many times as the justification for the war on the uh, this infamous speech on February 21st uh, preceding the full-scale invasion the same arguments and even if the informational warfare is much more diverse and even Putin himself has shifted recently to what's like playing with the global south but even like listening to his speech on the recent Valdai Forum, when the official speech was very much like decolonial sort of leftist leaning vocabulary, adapting it to please the global south. But then, if like listening to the Q and A session, this like big one, which was not translated into other languages on the presidential website, then we see we hear exactly all the same tropes already. Uh, given to us basically on the plate last year. So what were they? Uh, it's a very specific sort of historical teleology when he overtly says that basically the future is defined by the past. So to have a better understanding of the present and look into the future, we need to turn to history. 
The second one is that Russians and Ukrainians are one people, and this unity is defined by common language and common faith. So it's basically Russian and Orthodox community or polity, as you wish. Um, if Ukrainians somehow are not aware or do not wish to recognize this unity with Russians, that's because they were poisoned into some, uh, by some conspiratorial agents into thinking that they are different, and therefore it is called, like, independent Ukraine is basically the anti-Russia project. And it is not originating from Ukraine specifically, but from uh, Polish, Hungarian uh, uh, aristocracy, Western conspiracy, whatever. You name it, different, like, versions are there, but, but the bottom line is is that Ukraine could exist only as part of Russia. And you see some quotations uh, in the brackets. So that was something which was ignored not only by the international community, but by the Ukrainians himself, because it's something absurd and, and uh, you do not really know how to tackle that. However, uh, after the beginning of the full-scale invasion in February this year, when it became clear, like several weeks into that, that uh, the, ble the Blitzkrieg failed, that Kyiv did not fall in three days, and that basically the Ukrainian people do not wish to surrender to the Russian world, then the rhetoric becomes even harder. Harsh. And here I'm quoting another infamous essay, which could be ignored, it's not by Putin, but by Timofey Sergeyev, but it was published on the official resource, RIA Novosti. And that was even more explicitly genocidal in its rhetoric, and I see Russian colleagues nodding, uh, hopefully disapprovingly, to the statements, but approvingly to my point. So, uh, what is suggested here, again, so that's like just another stage of denazification, because now the war is just a sort of the denazification which took a practical turn. Which means we should give up on the idea that only the Kyiv authorities are bad, but Ukrainian people are good, but basically they're all bad and therefore they need to be extinguished. Which is called total lustration. Um, then this process, given the level of resistance in the Ukrainian society, this process will take not three days, but more than one generation lifetime, and it should be carefully guided. And a very nice caveat suggested that basically, yeah, you should not have any mercy because the tragedies and dramas of the wartime benefit the peoples who were tempted and carried away by their role as the enemy of Russia. And again, reiterating the same point that history has proved that it is impossible for Ukraine to exist as a nation state. And uh, uh, he goes as far as to say that Ukrainian version of Nazism presents a bigger threat to the world than the Hitler version of Nazism. Uh, now think again, we're not talking about the quality and the grounds of this argument, but I, let's like try to adopt it for a second the perspective of the Ukrainians, like, like reading all that and hearing all that, like how you should react to those statements. So a bit like rolling back to Ukrainian responses or versions of responses, because the previous, like what I just presented, used like a context, the more recent one. But now I'm humbly reminding you that the war has been going on for eight years. It started uh, in 2014, and there were several versions how to respond to these historical ground grounds or sort of um, rhetorical attacks, not like supplementing uh, the military ones. So the first version was the presidency of Pyotr Poroshe Petro Poroshenko, who was trying to be very anti-colonial and who tried to engage in historical wars. And he tried to prove that basically like Putin arguments are wrong. So basically trying to engage and to play on this field. So um, he was very explicitly anti-Russian in his domestic and uh, foreign policy alike. Um, I will talk about it a bit later. And then uh, Zelensky, like two stages of Zelensky before and after the full-scale uh, invasion. Okay. So Poroshenko. He chose sort of fixing the past as the sort of the backbone of his state policy. Uh, and, and he was very proud in certain achievements that were the decommunization laws, like a package of laws passed in 2015, gaining Thomas, giving some autonomy to the Ukrainian Orthodox Church, and uh, continuing some like dismantling Soviet monuments, so basically erasing the signs of the historical memory in the streets and in the names. And uh, I'm suggesting you some visuals 
supports in the presidential campaign of 2019, you can clearly see that the main slogan was away from Moscow which is like very like decolonizing or sort of anti-Russian. Uh, the package was like army, language, faith, and he was like directly building his public image against Putin as a rival challenging Putin as the only solution against the Putin's threat. As we all know, it failed. It did not meet the support, but it felt in a very interesting way because it was like welcomed by a quarter of Ukrainian society, a very active part of the Ukrainian society, but the majority was very cautious about this sort of radicalizing, very like, let's say, right wing with a caveat I can explain if, if we have time for Q&A. Uh, so what people opted again, uh -huh, okay, it's about the reception, I included that just like a an illustration, uh, half a year into the war, September 2014, um, you can see that the attitude of uh, Ukrainian population towards uh, civic symbols of the national identity like the flag and the anthem has improved. The attitude to Ukrainian nationalists has not changed. The attitude to Russian state has worsened and the attitude to the Russian culture and Russian language has not changed. So that kind of sets the framework of the majority of the population that tends to think that like Putin is bad, the Kremlin is bad, that the Russian culture is not, uh, and uh, being still very cautious about like nationalism in its like ethno-nationalist um, right-wing incarnation. Uh, so they instead overwhelming landslide victory of Zelensky. And if we look at another sociological poll in 2019, when people were asked what were the main challenges the president was expected to tackle, then they say basically that the main challenge was to, to stop the war. And that was the main electoral promise of Zelensky. So this is over 70% over of the electorate said basically that we want the war to be stopped. And however, it's not about the Euro integration or improvement of relations with Russia or symbolic politics or historical policies. All major positions were about raising the standards of living, lowering the utility costs, improving the quality of medical service, so very much like domestic issues. So what the society voted for, it was not like a pro-Russian stance or pro-European stance, but basically just like to live in better and not engaging in historical wars altogether. That was the demand that Zelensky was stepping into. And uh, analyzing the electorate uh, of two main rivals in the presidential election of 2019, you would see that people who were for the hard stance of Russia overwhelmingly supported Poroshenko. However, Zelensky managed to capture different parts of the electorate, both those who were like for hard stance of Russia and those who were not really. So what Zelensky did when he was elected? Uh, he tried to, to step away from historical wars, from memory wars, and, and uh, he, in his New Year's address on 2020, he said that basically, we want to live in the country where the name of the street does not matter, because it is lit and paved, where it makes no difference at which monument you are waiting for the girl you love. So that's a very poetic way to phrase the idea that basically historical policies, language policies, that's all, like all these symbolic games are not that important. We just need to, to to live properly, and that was exactly tapping in the moods of the electorate. So he was trying to articulate very like non-ideological visions for the country's future. Uh, and of course, we, like, those who follow the Ukrainian politics, you remember this promise that one just stop, needs to stop shooting and we can always meet in between, right? So that was the main electoral promise. However, his version of public rhetoric was very much, had a very special tonality, and I believe that was the main thing which made him very successful. First domestically, but now arguably on the global arena with his speeches, because what he's doing, uh, he's trying to, to invoke positive emotions in people who listen to him. So repeatedly over the years of Zelensky presidency, you can see repeating tropes with very positive emotional uh, signification. He talks about unity, he talks about hope, he talks about future, he talks about children, sort of invoking always some positive emotions. And that is omnipresent, and how, and I want to to mention that it worked. Because if we look uh, into sociological data from 2019, uh, you don't need to go into details, but what I mean here that basically um, 
there are very rare moments in Ukrainian uh, situation after 1991 when people are optimistic in the, about the future. And definitely Zelensky managed that. So with this sort of uh, positive rhetoric, he made people believe that we are moving towards a brighter future. And he uh, still has the level of support uh, which no, no, no previous uh, president of Ukraine enjoyed. And uh, it's not only when being like directly asked do you believe that the country is moving in the right direction? And people say yes. You can see in August 2019. But I also include here a very interesting index of um, consumer moods. So people invest in the future. People stop leaving the country and they start investing. So they, they do have expectations in a better future and they invest their money into that. So they prove it in their like, sort of actions, not only with statements. Um, Mixed policies of Zelensky. So basically what he was trying to do, and I'm talking before the big war, that he tried to one-sidedly quit memory wars with Russia, discursively construct a cleavage between like Russia, good Russian culture, good Russian people, and evil Kremlin trying to achieve its goals. Uh, he promoted tolerance to Russian cultural production and Russophone production, both allowing uh, Russian, um, let's say, cultural agents, different performers to, to come to Ukraine with their presentation, but also allowing all like different TV shows, different cultural products to be broadcasted on Ukrainian television. And interestingly, how he managed historical policies, he adopted this sort of accommodating historical policies where the canon of national history was mixing national and Soviet tropes all together that are representative to his own, I believe, personal upbringing, but also representative of uh, many people's perception of what is like contemporary Ukraine. And a good example would be, I will not be showing it, but if you are interested, you can look at this uh, short video. It's 10 minutes. It is called History of Ukraine in 10 Minutes. And it was broadcasted on the Independence Day of Ukraine last year. And it presents a very interesting, yeah? A very interesting, yeah, at least I'm looking at you, I'm <laughs> waiting for the signal. Uh, so um, it presents some specific uh, reference points that are included in the Zelensky government, the Zelensky presidency version of national history, and many points are omitted there. And, and Russian and Soviet atrocities are also like mitigated to the, any possible extent. So it is a very interesting uh, version of national history which could be deconstructed because it's, it's multi-layered and interesting in many ways. Um, okay, so what changed recently? So coming from this perspective that people and the president alike did not want any escalation and they were trying to downplay the historical uh, rivalry with Russia, these contested memories, but then they found they in the position of the full-scale invasion, which I call a zero point. And I would argue that uh, it changed a lot in the perception of the Ukrainians because in a way it is perceived as a such a big scale of a historical event that makes all the previous history irrelevant. So it doesn't matter what happened in the past because we are living now through something of such like an extraordinary scale that there are no doubts who is bad and who is good in this story. So we do not need to go to the history because it simply doesn't matter any longer. And, um, and this feeling of living through history, of history in the making, when you clearly see who is the aggressor and what his actions and the strat his strategies are, it somehow it, it, it just like um, closes many issues, let's say. And, um, and that, that was met like ambiguously, like I, I would probably underline in the very scarce remaining time, just two main points. <laughs> One would be Zelensky and his, um, and his global rhetoric, which is very much still on that sort of positive mobilization side. So as opposite to Poroshenko, he does not speak about Putin at all. And he's not even speaking about that much about like um, Russian injustice rooted in history, but he's trying to, to scale up the conflict of this, the war in Ukraine as something of global relevance, that we are in that together. And let's somehow tackle this issue together to move into the brighter future. So that's kind of the framework he's trying to, to promote to, to a large extent, trying to delocalize that conflict and to, to try to put some, uh, given the awful context, but still some positive accents here and there. So that's kind of uh, Zelensky strategy, whereas there is um, 
quite uh, like expected and not surprising at all, uh, radicalization on the ground. There, a lot of like uh, anti-colonial movement in Ukrainian society. Uh, I see another wave of language conversion when people uh, convert into Ukrainian. We had like several waves, but now it is like, so basically like to put it simply, and I'm sure you have heard this, that Russian rockets, they killed any like sympathy to Russia much more efficiently than any previous presidents or policies we were able to do. So now we have uh, a lot of initiatives that are not coming like uh, top-down from the government, but more coming from the society and from the activists. You see, for instance, just like two examples, this cancel Russia. So many like activists are trying to say that you cannot basically disentangle the Russian government from the Russian culture and the Russian society and trying to show how it works. Uh, and with many examples and many performances in, in, in many areas. And just one example, uh, some of you may know, Serhii Jadan, um, a writer from Kharkiv, recently awarded the Peace Prize um, at the Book Fair in Germany. So he is now making this flash mob. He's just making selfies with monuments to Pushkin in different towns of Ukraine. And the next day, these monuments get dismantled. So if we had like Lenin Oklazm, we had Lenin a Fall, which was mentioned before. So now it goes like deeper in, into history. So it's not about the Soviet legacy, but now it's about the imperial legacy, even like about more ancient times. So now, be, and, and a lot of controversies around the, the monument to the Catherine the Great in Odessa, which is now uh, expected to be dismantled, but it was vandalized, you see it. So these like different types of treating the, the monument, some of them are being protected from the shelling, uh, as in this installation uh, depicts us, you know, this covered with the bags with sand so that they are not destroyed by the shelling, and some of them are expected to be dismantled. So to conclude, um, this one falls on many levels, but also interesting, uh, I would say, on this sort of temporal dimension, because sometimes it is perceived as a war between the past and the future. There is a strong feeling in the Ukrainian society that Russia wants to drag Ukraine into the past, and once you engage talking on whatever side, who is right, who is wrong, you, you lose, because you are like in a reactive position. So basically, the, the common sentiment in the Ukrainian society is just like to close the past and to try to solve the situation in the present. And Russia is the threat. It needs to be somehow eliminated, and then we need to step into the future, which would not be defined by Russia. And therefore, the attitude to symbolic politics is a bit ambiguous, and, and we need to develop some nuanced approach here. A combination of post-colonial and anti-colonial move, I would say. But what is like truly interesting, and that would, really would be the closing point on my side, uh, we are living now in the age of the identity politics, right? So the populism on the rise and many, many actors and many politics, uh, polis, polities are trying to, to defend their identity, articulate it in various ways through different markers. What is quite uh, striking in the Ukrainian case today is that uh, Ukrainians build their identity today around the idea and the concept of democracy. And the recent research by Olga Onuk and Henry Hale proves that, that Ukraine stands in the first place as an unexpected case with a huge strike in rise of the support to democracy. But then if you complement it with some like qualitative research asking people like what it means, they basically perceive it that what is different between Russia and Ukraine, it is the political culture. And, and what, what we are defending is our right to define our future. And, and therefore, it's not about the rulers, but it's about our like, uh, ability to have an influence of the design of the polity. And therefore, that's a very like, peculiar version of identity politics built around the idea of democracy. And I'll stop here. Thank you for your attention. Yes, thank you very much uh, for your attention and also for uh, all of the speakers for these fascinating presentations. Uh, and our lunch break has theoretically started already. So I just propose uh, to probably organize one round of, of questions, uh, if you are fine with that. Uh, so I would like to now open the discussion for questions, comments, uh, remarks, uh, if you have any. Um, yes, we have. Wow, I would say, wow, I'm really overwhelmed by all these very interesting themes. Just 
And I would like to thank you to Yurai that he tackled the, the theme I failed to tackle in my, in my presentation. I just want to pick up one, one little subject uh, and ask Va Valeria. Uh, you talked about these grassroots reactions and um, that there is the, the mockery and humor used by this. But uh, as we uh, look at the, 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 the war, uh, we see that this is also on the official level, the, this mockery note and the, the, the humoristic, uh, you know, around the president and in, in the official statements, we can find it which we like. <laughs> I think, and I would like to ask whether this is something that comes with uh, Zelensky and his entourage, or is it something more uh, deep, just something more rooted in the Ukrainian culture? Yeah, that's that's it. Yeah, let's let's collect uh, the questions. Burkhard Osowski also has some. Yes. Thank you for all your presentations. Uh, I have a question to uh, Martin Kratofil and later on to Rekha Rekha Rakoshi. Um, hmm? Oh, just, uh, Rakoshi was a dictator. Sorry, 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 uh, she's not a dictator. <laughs> <laughs> well, it was wrong. <laughs> I do apologize. <laughs> well, the Hungarian language is somehow complicated. Uh, um, yeah, thank you for the, the data which you gave us, uh, which were very convincingly. Uh, I would like to ask you, well, which importance has, um, well, the past, or in particular the, the Czech Soviet past and uh, the, the invasion of Russian troops in 1968. Um, do you have also data uh, of, of, of different generations, uh, or can, can you give you, us some insights how these data or the attitude uh, towards Russia is somehow connected also with, well, the contemporary history? And uh, to Reka, uh, well, I really was fascinated like, by, <laughs> by your presentation, but I didn't know much about this, uh, probably like many other ones, uh, although the fact that uh, Hungary was involved uh, in the uh, well, in the war against the Soviet Union on the side of, of the Wehrmacht. Um, actually, I would be interested how the Ukrainian historians uh, reacted on these, your research, or were there also before some interests from the Ukrainian side to put an eye on these, well, on these uh, engagement of the second Hungarian army and is there still a place of dispute between Ukrainian and Hungarian historians or is there a field of well common research from both sides so that would be the question to you <laughs> okay thank you very much if you don't have any uh, questions more, uh, uh, please, yeah, 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 please uh, uh, answer the questions and uh, let's do it in an inverse order. So let's start with Valerie. Okay, yeah, thank you so much for your question. Uh, it's a good one because um, Ukrainians have very, so it's not connected to Zelensky, it's other, the other way around. Zelensky became popular because he tapped into that. So if we look uh, in the sociological data starting from 1991, what are the, the most popular TV shows in, 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 for the Ukrainian audience, that would be overwhelmingly the comic content all sort of comic show. And, and, and then we can like sort of deconstruct that, like how it works and why it is the case, but definitely that is, uh, humor is a political tool uh, in Ukrainian society and that has been the case for, for a while. But talking about the, um, the beginning of the full-scale invasion, I believe that this avalanche of different memes and jokes and the way to tackle and very, uh, 
serious situation with those of humor that was a powerful on the grassroots level. So of course you see the official speeches, right? So a lot of these like grassroots things are under the radar. But I believe that many, many cases of people uh, laughing in the face of the Russian invaders were signifying uh, the willingness to resist. It's one of the way to resist if you're not scared of the aggressor. And, and if I can, like following up a question, are we allowed to ask questions among ourselves? Hello. Yeah. Sure, sure. Okay. Um, yeah, I wanted just like to ask you quickly why Ukraine was put on, on the questioner only in 2014, given the amount of Ukrainian diaspora in Czech Republic. And the second one, do you have also qualitative uh, research complementing the data? Because I'm, I'm, ser I'm personally very much uh, fascinated with this Switzerland dream in Czech Republic. What it really means is it like the small nation sentiment that we do not want to care about geopolitics, or is it about that economy is more important than? politics and symbolic politics. Well, it's a difficult question because I'm not a political historian, I'm a film historian. Uh, I, but I know that uh, in this first uh, well-known adaptation, the Russians were not asked. So it was just a Hungarian point of view in Shara's Chronicle in the 1980s. Uh, but under the uh, depression of the Soviet official point of view, of course. There is one historian, a Ukrainian, and I can't uh, quote his name, unfortunately, but he is an interviewee in both later films, and he talks about the perspective of the Ukrainian uh, uh, inhabitants and locals, but there is no connection between the Hungarian researchers and the, Hung and the Ukrainian uh, uh, historians. I think it's, 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 it's still a... Uh, lacking uh, something, you know. So that, uh, I, I think that's the answer. <laughs> Uri, would you like to comment on something? Um, so uh, uh, it's difficult to to comment comment it. So, but um, okay, I don't have any comment. Yeah, sure. So, Martin, please. So, um, yeah. Thank you. Thank you for both your questions. Uh, yeah, thank you both for your questions. Uh, for uh, your question regarding the um, the impact of uh, our common history with the uh, Soviet invasion and here and staying of uh, Soviet troops, uh, I think it's a field where I think uh, our sociological research should meet uh, some insights and inputs from uh, historians and from uh, historical science. So to complex it together as uh, for the second uh, so so for me it's I can put there some interpretations uh, but I would need uh, some uh, more thorough historical compass uh, to uh, get the input uh, right and uh, also to have the interpretation um, like uh, anchored in uh, historical paradigms. Uh, but to your second question, or the second part, uh, the difference is, uh, uh, the main difference is uh, 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 shaped around the uh, DH. The DH is really the factor here, and it uh, is uh, quite interesting because uh, of its shapes uh, you here, like where uh, you, uh, the generations with a vivid uh, memory of the um, the invasion itself of the uh, 68th uh, um, invasion or the or the start of the uh, of uh, normalization, uh, they tend to uh, be more anti-Russian and hell, uh, hold uh, they hell, uh, they hold the uh, some grudges more more uh, serious grudges towards Russians. There are these uh, really living uh, or. Uh, those that have been lived uh, through uh, the years, uh, so they even if it uh, like fades away as we go uh, closer to uh, present day, uh, it's still uh, being shown in the generations starting nowadays around 55, 60. Uh, these uh, people who has this vivid. Uh, memory of uh, those sections, uh, they tend to uh, 
despise maybe even uh, Russians more. Uh, but then the, the, like the middle generation starting somewhere around 30s uh, to those 55s or middle uh, 50s, uh, these uh, are more like content with uh, Russians or maybe even not content but uh, less caring about them. But then again, uh, the youngest generations, this is the other part of the EU I mentioned, uh, they also uh, maybe through uh, uh, knowledge uh, from uh, schools or maybe also from recent actions of uh, Russia, they tend to uh, uh, give uh, also uh, lower uh, or the higher in this case uh, some, uh, marks and uh, be more critique to uh, uh, Russia. And to uh, is it is it uh, is it that what uh, you are trying to proceed? And uh, for your questions, I. Um, I really don't know why it happened uh, that uh, the uh, Ukrainian uh, Ukraine as itself was added uh, in uh, 2013. Lately, I I might assume it was uh, where there was some pinnacle of uh, uh, Ukrainian workers coming from uh, Ukraine to uh, uh, Czech Republic, but I really can't say what what uh, my predecessors uh, were led by to at Ukraine just in 2013. Um, and uh, I'm really sorry, <laughs> but uh, for, for you, your... Do you yeah, that, yeah. Like yeah. Uh, m I personally think that it's something, uh, and I really need to support here from uh, historians, that it's something that uh, is really uh, present in Czech and maybe Slovak uh, uh, to uh, the, the um, like the the common narrative or the something that we uh, feel like uh, right way to get or right position to get into. Uh, I think most likely from the uh, the end of the uh, of uh, the Second World War with. Uh, uh, strong position of uh, Edward Beneš, uh, uh, former president of Czech Republic, who really tried to uh, formulate this politics uh, around uh, throughout his life, uh, even before and even after the war, uh, like to position ourselves, like being this Swiss lake, some some Swiss mountain, some something like we uh, envelop ourselves in this uh, blissful ignorance and. Uh, great peace, uh, which is, uh, I personally think it's a really dangerous dream, like nowadays it really shows uh, when um, uh, Russian uh, misinformants and uh, domestic, uh, uh, um, domestic uh, pro-Russian uh, forces, they really use this narrative. As we have seen on, on the picture, there are not many people tending towards east, so the main narrative of uh, these forces is let's stay uh, peaceful, do not support anyone. We are here and we will stay calm and uh, for ourselves. And it's really just tackling this vast mass of people who really likes the uh, imagination, uh, image, image of Czech Republic being uh, really neutral, which is just a false dream in our case. Okay, uh, just only a uh, short remark. Uh, this position uh, to be of being somewhere in between the West and the East is also very typical uh, and most uh, widespread geopolitical stance of uh, Slovaks. And uh, um, I think uh, it's uh, very interesting that it has not changed, uh, changed too much, even after almost 20 years uh, of, B of uh, EU and NATO membership of uh, our countries. So this is also very typical how much it's stable. And regarding the young people and their attitude, for example, to the 1968 events, uh, uh, the, uh, also a huge portion of them simply uh, has no idea about it. This is also very uh, widespread uh, response. I don't know, have uh, exact, exact data, but uh, uh, this year was published um, a survey uh, regarding it. Okay, thank you. Let's continue our discussion during the uh, lunch break. So thank you very much once again for Man Martin, Jura, Ereka and Valeria uh, for their excellent contributions and also for your attention. Thank you.